Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. Uh, this is Shot Science Overtime number 103. Uh, so thank you guys for watching this. If you're watching this right now live, then you're probably one of the super early birds. Uh, if you're watching the recording, that's cool too. Just make sure that you're here every week on Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific time to watch the live show. You can send us your questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Anything basketball related is cool. So if it's about dribbling, shooting, playing defense, talking to your coach, strength and conditioning, whatever it is, we'll do our best mm -hmm. to either answer your question or send you in the right direction in terms of trying to, to get that info uh, that will help you. Yeah. Um, and so what we typically do is we like to have the first part of the show is a topic that we talk about, something that we think is going to help you guys take your game to the next level or help you out in terms of just developing your game uh, in the best way possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. So while we're doing that, what you guys are going to do is you're going to send us your questions. Uh, you can tweet them to us. We are at Shot Science. Um, you can also uh, send them to us on Facebook, Google Plus, here on the Google Plus uh, Q and A app that's here on the stream, or you can go over to the YouTube stream on our, our YouTube channel and send us the questions there as well. And we will do our best to get to as many people as we possibly can. If we don't get to you this week, then make sure you're back next week and we'll do our best to get to you then. Uh, but we'll shout you out on the air if, if we catch you guys. So um, we're going to get into it. And also remember that this is our live show. It's going to be a little bit longer and we do this for the people that are, they just want their questions answered. If, if you don't like it, then that's cool. Yeah. Check out our other stuff. We have several hundred videos that you can check out on any topic of basketball. Um, okay, so today's topic is practicing with an injury. And mm -hmm. when we were coming up with this idea, we kind of just wanted to uh, address something that we get all the time from people because people are always leaving us comments saying that they've, they've injured their ankle or they've tweaked their knee or they, they're coming back from some major surgery or whatever it is, but they want to know what they can do to keep practicing and keep developing their skills. Mm -hmm. But they're concerned because they're worried about uh, re-aggravating their injury or, or re-injuring themselves or, uh, you know, whatever it may be. But, uh, you know, when we get this question, we, we, we uh, pretty much have the same response every single time, which is basically just you need to be a little bit creative in figuring out ways to continue working on practicing your game uh, mm -hmm. and working around your injury. So... What are some thoughts on that one? You know, probably the injury that is most common uh, in basketball uh, are, are sprained ankles. And, um, you know, sprained ankles usually, uh, unless they're really severe, and your doctors are the ones that will have to tell you what they think about that, um, are usually a couple of weeks before you can really kind of get back on them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you should stop uh, doing anything basketball during that period of time. Yeah, a lot of people, they think of it as an excuse. Well, yeah. maybe, maybe they aren't the most dedicated people or whatever. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that if, if you're using it as an excuse, this, this, these things are not for you. No, 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 no. Uh, but the thing is, there, there's still uh, a lot of things that you can do. Um, one of the things that happens with people who have sprained ankles, there's nothing to keep you from working on your ball skills. Uh, you can take and, and move up and down the court if, unless you're on crutches. Uh, you can do that. You can sit in a chair and work on your ball skills. Uh, if you've got a bad ankle, uh, certainly I would really uh, uh, want my guys to be shooting the basketball uh, as much as they can during that time when they can't really move around otherwise. So yeah. well, I mean, those here... are important things to be able to do when you have an injury that still allows you to be uh, somewhat mobile. Yeah, so you want to just avoid the things that are going to aggravate that injury. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so obviously that you're not going to be running or sprinting up the court. Maybe you're not even putting weight on that leg. Right. But what you want to be able to do is work on the things around that. I mean, sure. because you hurt your ankle, but your arms are fine. Uh, you know, your, your other leg is fine. So sit in a chair, work on developing, getting that pounding uh, into your ball handling, uh, you know, kind of just get the, the control down for your ball handling. And that, that will really help. And also you can work on just kind of very simply dialing in your, your shooting. You can use the form shooting drill from real close in and really work on dialing in your mechanics. And, you know, maybe it takes a week, two weeks for that ankle to heal, but you've already put in all this effort to really dial that stuff in. And then as soon as that ankle is better and you're, you're ready to kind of amp up the, the game speed, game intensity stuff, you've put all this work into having all these other skills kind of polished and you're going to be really ready to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, the same is true with, with any kind of injury, except maybe something like a head injury or a concussion or something like that. Th those are things you don't want to mess around with. Right. 
Um, but, uh, you know, maybe, you know, one of the things that a lot of people do is they get jammed fingers and stuff like yeah. that. So if you jam, you know, your strong hand finger, some, you know, on your right hand or what, if you're right-handed, uh, if you jam that finger, maybe it's time to really start working on developing that offhand when you, with your dribbling, um, or maybe offhand layups, whatever it is, uh, you know, you, you obviously you can't focus on that strong hand now. So do what you can with the other hand and right. really bring that one up to the, the kind of the level that it, it, it needs to be. Um, one of the things that happens uh, uh, when we do have those kinds of injuries, uh, sometimes we just say, well, I'm just going to lay back and I'm not going to do anything. Well, that's the worst possible thing you can do for the game because you game, your game begins to deteriorate uh, when you're not very active in it. But if you can stay active, whether it's shooting or ball handling or whatever, all of that is going to really help you in the long run. That's that's real important stuff. Yeah. And, you know, like we were saying earlier, if, if you want to use it as an excuse – to not play then then that's yeah. that's something different but uh you know people that really want to have things happen and make them happen um are going to come up with a way to to kind of make those things actually occur so if if you have some limitation that doesn't mean that you can't do anything yeah. i mean that's that's the worst kind of mentality you can have if you want something to happen figure it out yeah you know there are <clears throat> certainly some injuries that are are kind of uh uh, serious that are going to mean that you really can't get going and do much uh, like Casey mentioned a while ago, like a concussion or something like that, or a broken leg. But even though uh, maybe you have a broken limb, a broken uh, a finger or something like that, usually there's still something that you can do. You just don't want to do it in a re, uh, high intensity competitive uh, situation. But uh, certainly while the other team, the members of your team maybe are working on uh, uh, their team stuff, you're over at a side basket and you're working on your stroke. Uh, you're working on your dribbling, as Casey mentioned. So uh, depending on how um, uh, how sincere you are about your game and how you want to keep it uh, uh, elevated, uh, that will determine how much time you're going to take and spend on it. We have had a young guy that uh, has had a uh, uh, an ankle injury. It's not really um, – let's say it's a lower leg injury and maybe even a high ankle sprain, but he's been inactive for about three weeks. Finally, he was able to come back. Uh, and we couldn't get him to really spend any time um, practicing on, on his shooting and stuff like that while we were practicing. But, uh, you know, that's just different strokes for different folks. Yeah, and, you know, uh, if you think about some of the players that have been injured recently, like um, Paul George or even Derek Rose mm -hmm. um, or Kobe, I, I can guarantee those guys did not just sit around. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe there was some times around, like, their surgery or the injury itself where they kind of – they. <laughs> it was so traumatic that they couldn't do anything for a while. But I can guarantee as soon as they were able to do anything, they were sitting in a chair, they were pounding the ball. Um, you know, as soon as they could get on crutches, they were probably out on the court shooting off of one leg. Um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the, the way you have to be when you play sports. Injuries pretty much happen to everybody. They do. Whether they're, they're you know, very minor or very severe. I mean, it's just it's part of, of playing these physical activities. And, you know, if, if you kind of sit out every time you get a little uh, nick or, or jam a finger or whatever, you're, you're probably not going to be playing very much at all. And like we always talk about is consistency. And if you're able to stay consistent despite injury or despite, uh, you know, illness or whatever it is, uh, consistent, consistency will help you in always being consistent with your play too, because if you're consistent in practice, you'll be consistent in play. So, uh, sitting out for long periods of time, Oh, I, I sprained my ankle. You sit out for that two weeks, you come back, you're not going to be able to do the things that you did, uh, right when you had the injury, because you're going to be so rusty at them. Um, so if you're able to kind of stick with it and get out there and sit in a chair, like we said, sitting in a chair and working on your ball handling is something that even people that aren't injured do. Um, and it's, it will only help you with your ball control. Right. Uh, you know, that said, uh, one of the things you also have to be aware of is, uh, if you have a doctor involved who is treating you, then you want to listen to them, uh, because they will tell you they've got experience in dealing with injuries and whatnot. They'll tell you the things that they think that you can do. And you can feel free to ask them questions about that as well. Uh, you know, uh, am I able to uh, stand and, and shoot a basketball? And am I, uh, am I able to sit and dribble a basketball? And they will tell you up front, well, you can do this and you can do that. Otherwise, um, you know, I don't want you to be very active. I want your healing to be complete. And so you kind of have to listen to those <coughs> doctors as well. 
yeah, I mean, that's super important. Like, uh, if, if you are dealing with any kind of injury or anything like that, that is especially one that a doctor should be a part of, you need to listen to what they say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, every injury is going to have a level of severity. And so, you know, maybe sitting in a chair and working on your ball handling is a little bit more than you need to be doing. But, you know, maybe s sitting there with a basketball and just keeping it in your hands, maybe working on your your follow through and stuff like that. Very uh, kind of uh, laid back. That's cool. But you have to kind of figure out what works for you. And that's that's one of the things that is a big deal for uh, for anybody that's working on developing their skills. Some people are always saying, you know, it's snowing outside or it's it's raining or, uh, you know, I don't have any place to work out or whatever. Same thing applies. You need to figure it out. You need to be creative and you need to stop making excuses. Uh, you know, there's there's plenty of guys in the NBA. They didn't have a court readily available to them every single day. Uh, you know, they there's not a playground court that's always available in, in Chicago or or any of these places where it's snowing during the winter. But you have to figure I mean, there's plenty of players from Alaska. They figured out something, you know, some way to make it happen. So you need to be kind of in the same boat whether it's an injury, whether it's the weather, whether it's a court available, um, whether it's getting on a specific team that you want to play for, um, you need to figure out a way to make it happen. And, you know, if you make excuses and just sit it out, then that's that's not a great way to become yeah. a great player. Yeah. Right? I mean, do you have anything more to add to that? No, not really. I, I just think that um, don't baby yourself too much, and yet uh, don't jeopardize yourself either kind of find that middle ground where you can maybe do a few things and yet nothing that's going to take and set you back, phys uh, set you back physically. Uh, you know, one of the things that we posted last week in our, um, on our uh, channel, which I thought was really awesome, and it was a picture of a young guy uh, in the middle of a highway or road, uh, snow piled up on the sides, and there he was in his snow gear, uh, and he was dribbling the basketball. And that said a, a, an awful lot about um, that person's commitment to maintaining their game, getting better. Uh, and they, they uh, uh, didn't just uh, sit back and say, well, I can't do anything because it's snowing or well, it's raining or whatever. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Before we go, I mean, one of the, some of the things that we've kind of received just being uh, kind of part of the internet and, you know, we team shot science is it kind of is, is a global thing. And there's people that watch our videos and they're that are, interact with us daily that are from everywhere and you know we get people from the philippines that send us pictures of them practicing during floods yeah. uh we have pictures from people that are uh you know from countries that are buried in snow whether it's canada or or uh europe, europe someplace or russia or whatever and they send us pictures of them completely outfitted in their snow gear um you know wearing gloves uh, just completely bundled up and they're outside playing in the snow. And it's yeah. like, these, these are people that are fully motivated and they're, they're, they've got the figure it out in full effect going on. <laughs> uh, and the same thing uh, applies, like we said, to injuries as well as just figuring out the weather and courts and stuff like that. Um, and before we kind of close out that topic too, I want to suggest that you guys go check out uh, Alan Stein's videos from stronger team because he'll, he'll show you ways to kind of uh, not only recover from injuries, but also prevent injuries. So if you're having problems with ankle injuries or knee injuries, or those are things that you're concerned with, then go check out Alan's videos because he'll help you in both the recovery phase and the prevention phase. Uh, yeah. In fact, you know, um, one of the things that I was really impressed with his material was, was the uh, exercises to help avoid ACL tears. Uh, and I think that that's something that is so common in basketball these days. I don't remember that being such a big problem uh, years ago uh, when I was a young guy, young coach, young player. Uh, but it becomes it has become more of a part of the game, particularly for female athletes. And it has to do a lot from just talking to Ellen and others as well. Uh, just kind of the shape of the hip structure of males versus females. Well, and, it's physiology and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's a thing that's real important there is to kind of learn how to uh, make that uh, preventable. Um, our family, we've had three of those ACL injuries and uh, they're, they're really grueling. And <laughs> you and me are the only ones that have We're the so. only one that has escaped. Thank gosh. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, you know, like Connor, my youngest brother, he blew out everything in his yeah, knee and everything. that's, that is not something that you want to deal with at all. Right. Um, okay. So 
go check out Alan Stein's videos on injury recovery and prevention. Make sure that you guys kind of build the mentality that you have, that you have to figure it out. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one of the best things you can do. Yeah. Figure it out, be your own coach and be creative because if, if you can find a way to do it, then you you're, that's half the battle. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to close out that hopefully that helps you guys in figuring out how to work with an injury when, when you want to continue kind of building your game. Uh, if you have more questions on that, send them to us, uh, Twitter's a great place. We're at shot science there. Um, we're going to close out the topic, start sending us your questions if you have them and we'll start answering them on the air. You can send them to us on Twitter. We're at shot science, Facebook, Google plus here in the Q and a app on the Google plus stream or in the stream on YouTube for this video. Um, and if you can go out and tell your friends and family to watch the show, because that really helps us be able to get cool people to, uh, bring on as guests. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago we had on, uh, Grayson, the professor Boucher from and one and ball up. Uh, we've had Danny green from the San Antonio Spurs and we've had college coaches and we've had coaches that help get kids like you guys get into college programs. So if you want more people like that, go out there and tell your friends and family to watch the show. That really helps. Um, okay. So let's jump into some questions here. Let's see. We're going to go to, to the comments first. Um, this one is from Jose Araujo, who Araujo. said, Araujo, who says, is it a good idea to play with shin splints or no? Thank you in advance. You know, <clears throat> shin splints uh, are kind of an interesting injury that occurs with a little tearing of the tissue <clears throat> where the muscles attach to the large bone in, in your lower leg. And usually that is an early season kind of thing. Uh, and you should take and respect that a little bit and make sure you ice them and uh, um, before and after you work out. And if it begins to get more serious, then you may have to take a rest while they have a chance to heal. But it's a pretty common, uh, pretty common injury. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. If you're feeling pain or if it's something that's debilitating, you need to go to a doctor immediately and get that figured out. Yeah. Um, a lot of times shin splints and things that of that nature are a result of, of not getting enough uh, recovery time, not warming up properly, things like that. Um, so again, we would tell you to go check out Alan Stein's videos and kind of get a warm up routine going. You can also check out our videos, um, our, our vertical jump videos, because in there we have the dynamic stretching package that you can use before games and before practices that will kind of help you warm up your muscles, kind of try to limit those overuse injuries yeah. uh, like shin splints. But you need to be careful in in over overworking that kind of injury because that's how you got injured in the first place. Right. Well, the, the uh, shin splints are typical of early season where we're just starting to work out and we really haven't done much for a while. That's usually when that occurs. Okay, this one is from uh, Lawman uh, in the chat who says, sometimes I cannot shoot the ball outside because it's freezing. What are some drills that I can do in my house that help me shoot and keep my form correct? Okay, well, first, like we were saying earlier, you need to figure it out, number one. Uh, and a lot of times people feel like if they they can't shoot outside at their house or at their selected playground or whatever, then all, you know they're done. Yeah. Uh, what you need to do is maybe figure out a way to get into a gym, whether that's uh, contacting your local coach or the coach that you play for and saying, hey, is there any way we can get some gym time or an open gym set up? Uh, or maybe going to find a YMCA or some other kind of uh, kind of more uh, you know a public meeting place that has a that has a court or something like that. That would be your number one option. Figure something out like that. Number two, if if there's if if you know you can't get that worked out right away or or you need something to do otherwise, uh, you know it's fine to go inside your house and work on kind of dialing in your mechanics. Maybe you you have a high enough ceiling that you can find a spot on the wall to hit. Um, or, you know, just working on getting that, that release feel. I mean, there, th that's really kind of all you can do. Yeah, you know, uh, it certainly helps a bunch to just lay down on your bed and just toss the ball up and catch it, and toss the ball up and catch it. All of that is pretty much the same motion as you're using when you're shooting. And so uh, something like that would help as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that really helps is, you know, we see this a lot when we work with kids that, are, especially they're just learning or whatever, but they have such stiff wrists, like there's so much tension. Right. If you can work on, you know, laying down on your bed or just sitting in a chair or whatever and working on kind of getting that flop finish and having it be super relaxed, then you're going to be in really good shape. And that's right. something that you don't necessarily need a basket 
to, uh, you know, kind of yeah. work on. Um, and, you know, the other thing too, is that, uh, let's see, what are some other things? Like if you want to work on uh, catching a dress with the basketball, maybe you can get your mom or dad or brother or sister or whatever to throw you the ball and, you know, you catch it and you address the basket, you know, uh, it's one of those situations where, you know, you, you catch the ball and you're stepping into your shot like you're going to shoot it. Um, that's definitely something you can work on without a basket because you don't have to necessarily go up into your shot. You can, you know, go into like your, uh, your set point essentially. Um, but thinking like that, thinking of ways to make it happen, that's the best thing that you can do. Um, okay. This one is from Twitter. This is from at Joseph Coombs one, who's Joseph Coombs. He says, uh, how do you hedge screens? <clears throat> well, that's an interesting question. It's a, um, it's a little bit hard to do without a demonstration, but we'll talk it through a little bit. Well, it is. And it, we're talking about, I think, by the defensive player hedging. Yeah. I think that's really what you're getting at is that, well, one of the first things that you, you typically do in a hedge is that when you see your guy is going or girl is going over to set a particular screen, then you want to step up and you want to be on the high side of them. And so that the defender or the person with the basketball cannot split that screen. And then what you want to do, uh, the typically what they want to hedge on the screen is to push that person more toward the uh, uh, midcourt line and not let them get over the split line to the other side. That's typically what the hedge is all about. And so um, that's really how you do it. You know, if you lay back, it, you, there's no way it's going to happen. You have to step up and you, and, and some coaches even talk about having your hand on the hip of the person that is setting the screen, that you just kind of touch them there, and then you step out, and you want to be perpendicular uh, to the path that dribbler. You don't want to be flat because they can come right across <coughs> your face, but what you want to be is perpendicular. Uh, if Casey were setting the screen right here, then I would be perpendicular to him so I can take on that dribbler right away. And that's essentially how you uh, set up to hedge. And then you have to move your feet. Don't let them take and run over you. And you want to control them. And if they're going to go any place, the only place they can go is where they come from or toward the midcourt. Yeah. And, you know, another thing to consider, too, and w whenever we talk about defense, anything, you know, shot science, defense related, we always talk about being in control and, and setting kind of uh, the you being the one that's making the action happen. If you sit back and relax and wait and react on defense, then that's the worst thing you can really do yep. because you're going to be a step behind that guy no matter what you do. Same thing is true when you're hedging a guy on the screen. You want to make sure that you're stepping up and making them have to react to you, not the other way around. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you'll see people, they kind of hedge and it's kind of like an apprehensive thing where they're just stepping over. You don't want to do that. You want to step up and make them, force them to do some kind of decision making right there. That's when they're going to kind of make the mistake or they're not going to be able to, to split it or whatever. Right. Uh, so make sure that you are kind of the one that's, that's really being assertive. Um, okay. Let's see. This one is from hmm, Saleh Rahani, who says, I'm healing muscle imbalances from overtraining, and I know what to do about it, uh, but I think it's important to teach the younger kids how to avoid the issues because it's a problem uh, that you can sometimes see in college uh, and even the pros. It's something that made me more injury prone, and I believe it's what ended uh, this certain player's career. Um, and so what are some things that you can do to avoid injuries is their follow-up. So like we said, and you know, I mean, that's, that's true. Overuse injuries are a real big problem, but, uh, you know, go check out Alan Stein's videos and he'll show you how to avoid those ankle injuries and ACL injuries and things like that. Um, and you know, a lot of it is, um, <clears throat> just working with uh, kind of lateral movements and things like that, that a lot of players don't work through. Um, those movement patterns that are very lateral, you, you put a lot of sheer force on your knees and things like that. And that can, that can cause a lot of problems. And, you know, one of the other things that Alan talks about too, is kind of overuse of, of things like ankle braces and braces in general. And what happens when you do that is when you wear an ankle brace, uh, for longer than you really need to be wearing it to just kind of avoid injuries is that you kind of come to rely on it. And then uh, you know, the joint like your ankle is going to kind of become weaker just because it doesn't have those uh, balancing muscles built up. Um, 
And also you're isolating that single joint. And so what it would kind of, uh, you know, spread across three different joints, like your hip, your knee and your ankle, you're now you're putting a lot of force into your knee and your hip. And that's why a lot of injuries happen uh, in terms of your ACL is just because, you know, people are isolating the, their, their ankles with these ankle braces and you put so much shear force in your knee and that, that's going to cause a lot of problems. Well, the other thing goes along with that usually that when we're having those kind of imbalances in training or overtraining, as, as he has just mentioned here, uh, it's due to using um, probably weights, uh, free weights, or maybe even not free weights, but just um, weighted machines. And one of the things with Alan's program is that he is using pretty much uh, body weight to take and deal with uh, developing the muscles and, and uh, uh, balances there. That, that, I just well, think that's awesome. Yeah, well, here's two things that I will talk about that because I, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm pretty, pretty well versed in terms of weight training and things like that because that's mm -hmm. stuff that I do. But two of the major things I see problems with for kids, especially kids that are playing basketball and such, is that one, they're, they're working out with weights and stuff like that, and they have no idea what they're doing. Yep. Um, and even if you think you know, you probably don't know, you should have a trainer, somebody that has all the uh, certifications and things like that. They should be working with you on a program. You should be working uh, on developing a program with them and, and making sure that, that uh, they're showing you what to do. Simply watching YouTube videos or whatever is not really the best way to go about it because even though you might think that you're doing things correctly, you know, there, there's, there's certain, um, certain uh, mechanics and, and stuff that you need to make sure you have in place to make sure that you're not hurting yourself. And it's hard to do if you don't have somebody else observing what you're doing that knows what to look for. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's not just kids. That's, that's anybody at the gym. If you go to the gym and you, there's a majority of people are not doing things safely. Um, number two, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, uh, a lot of people, they don't get the idea that you should be using weights as a resistance tool, not as, uh, an ego booster. <laughs> so a lot of times you'll see people, they go, they'll go in and they're, they're, you know, doing squats and they're putting a, a ton of weight on there and it's mostly just an ego thing and they're not even doing it correctly. They're doing knee flexes instead of squats. Um, that, that is not a good way to approach working out with weights. If you're going to use weights, they should just be a resistance tool. So you should only use as much as you need to uh, add enough resistance to fatigue your muscles for the specific amount of reps you're going to do. So if you, if you want to have a rep range of 10 to 12, you should only be using enough weight to where that 12th uh, rep is going to be very difficult for you. If you're doing it so that you are loading up weights and you're compromising your mechanics and you're not even getting anywhere near that rep range, then you need to reevaluate your approach to weight training um, because that's that's not a way to approach it. And Alan would show you the same stuff. So uh, definitely check out Alan's uh, strength and conditioning videos because they, they're very helpful. And also seek a trainer out if, if you want to do that kind of stuff. And if you're a young kid, I would say just don't even worry about weight training and stuff like that. Uh, stick with conditioning and strength, strength and conditioning uh, movements without weights is a good idea because as a kid, you should be developing your skills more anyway. That's going to take you further than any amount of muscle or whatever that you add to your body. Um, okay. Let's see. This one is from Ferris Repak who says, do you have tips on how to get better at shooting? Yes. Yeah, really. We have a lot. Um, if you go to our, our channel and check out our shooting playlist, uh, we have a ton of videos in there that, that tell you anything you want to know about shooting. Uh, we're working on new shooting videos. Um, if, you, if you have something specific that you want us to answer, I mean, just let us know and we'll do our best to, to answer that for you. Um, okay, this one is from Life Lesson or Life Less 50, who says, uh, I've been coming off an injury that put me on the sideline for two months. And since I started to play again, I've been horrible. How can I play like my old self again? You know, just to take, it'll take time. Uh, and one of the things that happens here is that your physical uh, development has been compromised. Your physical ability has been compromised. And it just take a while for you to work back into it. It might take you several weeks to do that. Just stay after it and it will come back. It's not like you forget how to do a lot of things. It's just that your muscles uh, atrophy when you don't use them properly. Uh, and in the same manner, you normally use them. And so it just takes a while for you to come back. You'll be good. You'll be good. Yeah. I mean, you just need to really focus on the fact that that you haven't had the consistency yeah. 
Um, and if you drop off and you don't work out for, or not work out necessarily, but uh, you don't work on any of your skills for that time period, two weeks, that's a long time. Sometimes you can stop working out for three days and all of a sudden your shot is just garbage. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that you have to be in there polishing every type of skill that you're trying to develop every day if you want it to be there at any given day. Yeah, um, sure. You know, a lot of people, they ask if they should build their workouts so that they have one one workout that is just gnarly shooting for one day a week. And and then, you know, then they'll have a one day where it's just a ton of uh, ball handling stuff. And then one day where it's just a ton of, uh, you know, rebounding or whatever it may be. And we try to kind of guide people away from that because what happens is that, okay, you work out really, really hard on Monday on having this, this insane shooting workout. If you show up on Friday or Saturday and you need to be in a game and have that stuff be there for you, it's not going to be there for you because you haven't worked on it for four days. And, uh, you know, so what we like is, you know, it's, it's fine to put emphasis, you know, emphasize stuff on certain days. Uh, so maybe you have a day where you're emphasizing more shooting stuff, or you have a day where you're emphasizing more defensive stuff, but you need to make sure that you're hitting a little bit of everything every single day. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's how you stay kind of um, uh, on top of things. Otherwise, like Casey said, you'll if you lay off the shooting for three or four days, you will slide. You maybe come back in a couple of days, but then if you are away from it, you slide. You, and sliding meaning that uh, you're going to be less effective as a shooter if you haven't spent time on it. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of those things where uh, I don't know if you guys have been watching the news or listening to, to ESPN or anything like that. But, uh, you know, a few of the big names like LeBron and Kobe have been talking about the fact that AAU is damaging to, uh, you know, skill development in basketball. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, some of the international players are so much more skilled than the ones here in the U.S. Right. And, you know, a lot of that comes down to the fact that if you're playing a ton of games, you're not necessarily developing or working on your skills. You're, you're just essentially playing games. Right. Um, and, you know, we I think we probably both agree with that 100%, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, and so the same is true in that sense is that you you are playing in games, but you're not working on developing your skills. And so the skills are not going to be there necessarily if you need them. Well, there's another thing that comes into play um, uh, with regard to that. And that is a lot of players uh, who are really athletic, they have the ability to do things that are beyond what the normal human being is able to do. Um, find that they can get by by doing that. Um, maybe it's leaping and leaping and dunking. Uh, and so they become very proficient at that, but maybe they don't shoot the ball very well. Um, and maybe they don't handle the ball very well because they spend so much time just relying upon natural athleticism. And, and that's, that was the major uh, uh, point, I think, of both, both those pro players is that uh, there's just too much emphasis on allowing players to just play with that athleticism and not enough on really developing the skills of the game. Yeah, I mean, and here are th those are big voices. I mean, and both of them played a, a basketball. They did. And um, uh, yet they feel like um, by bringing that out, there's been a lot of, of, of uh, people voicing their opinion one way or another on that on the Internet recently. But you know, we kind of fall in line with the fact uh, I coached uh, not an AAU team, but we, we were AU for a while. And then I left and went to another program that was a travel team, not an club AAU team. program. It was a club team. And uh, the club team, the emphasis totally was on developing skills. Yeah. I mean, there's practices, there's clinics, there's oh, yeah. uh, just a heavy focus on skill development. It's right. not just about going out and playing or getting in front of, of uh, scouts and stuff like that. Right. Like they do that too, yeah. but there is a heavy emphasis on, on skill development. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think I put out a tweet or something the other day because people were saying stuff about how the best basketball players skill wise are in the NBA and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's like, that is, that is so not the case necessarily. Yeah. I mean, of course there's going to be some of, some of the best are going to be there. Um, but if you travel through uh, some of the Midwestern states like Iowa and Utah and, and Indiana, you will find the best shooters on the planet there. Yeah. These are guys that do not miss. 
And they, they, the only reason that they're not going to higher levels, levels of basketball is because they don't have the body size. They don't have the physical attributes. They don't have the athleticism, or maybe they don't have the drive, or maybe they don't, uh, see themselves playing after a certain point and they need to move on and make another decision in their life. So, uh, you know, one of the things I wrote is that, uh, you know, NBA players are packages. They are a package of size, uh, you know, athleticism and then skills. And usually a heavy dose of the first two can take you a very long way. Yes, truly. Um, and so you guys need to always remember that, that, uh, you know, it's the guys in the NBA. A lot of them are very skilled. Most of them are very skilled, but a lot of them get by on a heavy dose of size and athleticism for yeah. sure. Um, okay. Let's go to the Q and a app here on Google plus. And this one's from Dan Melinchuk who says, do you have to play high school basketball in order to play in college? You know, no, you don't have to. In fact, uh, there seems to be uh, some situations where there are people who are, are uh, uh, staying with their club teams and not playing on high school teams. And they have an opportunity if they have the, the skill package and whatnot to go ahead and play in college. So no, you don't have to go to high school uh, to be able to play in college. Yes, but however, but. however, there is a qualification for the uh, um, for Division One, Division Two, and probably I don't think there is one yet for Division Three. If there is, I don't know what that one is. But there are, is a, a, a requirements course requirements that you have to fit, and that doesn't mean you have to play basketball in high school, but you have to get an education that has all of those core courses. And I think there's sixteen courses that you have to have over the four years that you are in high school, but you do not have to play high school basketball uh, to play college basketball. However, but, most do. Yeah. But also you need to make sure that you're just not foregoing high school basketball and have some strategic plan to play college basketball. Uh, that might not work out. I mean, yeah. it, that, that really depends. Um, I, I think that it's probably better to play high school basketball. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, the way things are going, uh, and this has a lot to do with uh, uh, T uh, AAU and club basketball there uh, and prep basketball. Um, there are prep schools who are being organized kind of around. Uh, there. There's education component, but it is an awful big part of a basketball component in some of these prep schools. And so, uh, you pretty much, you are going to be a high school student when you're there, uh, but you don't have to be to play in college. Yeah. But you um, do have to have the grades and meet those core requirements or you don't get to play. Yeah. And you also have to figure out a way for a coach to see you too. Yep. Um, well, the thing that goes through my mind when you're talking about um, not playing in high school is that probably you are playing on a club team. If you're playing on a club team, your chances are probably pretty good. If you're not playing in high school and not playing on a club team, your chances of making it are probably nil. Yeah, but the, the other thing too, though, is also maybe you uh, didn't have the drive or the grades or something like that in high school and you are already in college. If you go out and you try to be a walk-on or you try to, um, you know, maybe... I don't know, be on a club team after that, that would be kind of difficult. But yeah. uh, if, if you try to be a walk-on or something like that, uh, then, you know, that that's something that happens every once in a while too. Sure. So, I mean, if, if you're worried about whether you should give up or not, I mean, don't give up. No. Figure out a way to make it happen. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go to Twitter. This one's from Nathan Thompson, who's here every week. He's at Nate T underscore AF. Uh, he says, hey, so I figured out by watching a slow motion video of myself that I released the ball before I jumped. I think that this is the reason I suffer at the three point line and I'm going to work through the three pillars to fix it. Just wondering how long do you think it will take to correct and should I be trying to shoot the new way in games? Okay, let's take them uh, one point at a time. Probably how long it will take is probably a couple of weeks of pretty, uh, um, pretty hard work and you'll find that it starts to change and, and get what you want to do. Oh, and it, it'll take a couple of weeks before you really ingrain it. it yeah. It, it will start happening right away. It really. will, but it won't be ready for you to use in a game situation until you've probably got a couple of weeks of work in. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, 
Uh, what was the second part of that question? I forgot what it was. Uh, he, he was just wondering how long it will take to correct and if he should start shooting that way in games. Um, as, you know, what's going to happen is you'll probably continue to shoot the way you normally shoot in games through that the first part of that several weeks. And then what you're going to do is you're going to find that there's starting to be a, some effect of your change in there uh, in the second or third week. And by the end of the third week, uh, it would be my guess that if you're working really hard, you're probably going to be uh, uh, able to use that in game situation to be fairly effective with it. Yeah, I mean it's going to be tough because you're probably in season right now. Yeah, yeah, um, it's, it's tough to find the time to work on some of that uh, and practice and do homework and and all of that kind of stuff too. Yeah, so I mean you're going to have to do a lot of diligent practice, get a ton of repetitions for that to start to make a switch, right. and it's hard to do that during the season. So I mean. I think that, uh, but thankfully, fixing where you release the ball, it's a little bit easier than some of the other stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would say go for it. And if you can do it during the season, just go ahead and, and make it happen. Maybe you've put a few heavy days in where you're trying to get a lot of reps with that and, and work on the form shooting drill and then use the three pillars to kind of step it up, as you were saying. Well, I think he mentioned that he was shooting the ball on the way up. Is that kind of what it says there? Yeah. Um, you know, really the release point on, on jump shooting, and I suppose you're talking about jump shooting, is as you reach the top of your jump, the ball wants to be on its way. Yeah. Oftentimes what happens is that we jump and we hold the ball uh, and we're starting to fall back to the floor, and that's when the release, that's when the ball is almost always short and flat. But when, and you'll feel it because it will feel underpowered. It's, there's no question about that. And uh, what you want to do is as you reach the top of the jump, the ball is already on its way. And you get the leg power that you want, and uh, the ball probably will have uh, plenty of arc. Yeah, and, and really, it's just um, – oh, what was I going to say? I was going to say, well, good job on actually – taking a video of yourself yeah. and, and looking at the slow motion of it. A lot of people don't do that. And that's, that's great because you can kind of become your own coach on all that yeah. stuff. Awesome. Um, but yeah. So if you are shooting the ball and, and you're releasing it either too early or too late, um, you know, there's going to be different problems when, when it's too late, you, you've already lost a bunch of the power and it's been sapped out and you have to do a lot of extra things with your upper body, which will take up, out of the accuracy yeah, of your shot and yeah. then if you're doing it too early then it's hard to really get the right power yeah. when you when you're doing that well and oftentimes the ball takes off on you uh when you shoot the ball early sometimes the ball will just take off and you'll be long yeah in your shot if you check out our video on the release point for jump shots i think we even demonstrate how that kind of happens right. too so check out that video release point for jump shots um okay uh, so if you guys have questions, start sending them to us right now. We're almost to the lightning round time. So uh, <laughs> if you have questions, now would be the time. Um, let's see. This one is from Jennifer Lopez. It's J-Lo. It's the J-Lo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jennifer is saying, how do I jump higher? Check out our videos on the vertical jump. Uh, if you, I think if you even just type in vertical jump training, we're one of the first few that is up there. Uh, we have two videos that are the main videos on there. We run you through all the exercises that we think are the best for young people trying to develop their vertical. Then we also have the vertical jump handbook, which is three months of daily workouts that that are set up for you. So you just have to do the works uh, that we say, and and it should help you start to really kind of develop your vertical. Right. So check out that. Um, let's see. This one is from Mickey Tadic, who says. I'm a really good shooter in the park in practice, but in games I only shoot open jumpers. But my coach is yelling, is telling me that I should shoot contested jumpers because in practice I hit like 50% of them. But my question is, am I being a ball hog when I shoot contested jumpers? Thank you, coach. Why would your coach tell you to shoot contested shots? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, one of the things that that I wish, and maybe one one day we'll do this. Uh, there is a university here on the West Coast that charts every shot, uh, every pass that is made during the course of the game, and how that affects your ability to shoot the basketball as far as accurate, accuracy. And uh, one of the things that, that we just kind of feel is real important is that if it's a consensus shot, it's not a shot. Uh, what you want to do is look for shots where you're not going to have to be contested uh, because often they can be blocked. Often we change the uh, form of our shot in order to avoid being blocked. Or I, just the urgency of shooting when well, somebody's coming yeah, at you. Yeah, hurrying the shot. All of that uh, kind of spells uh, disaster. Uh, 
Now, the thing is that I find it kind of hard to believe that uh, you're shooting these things, but you still have consistent form because usually that form is the first thing that goes downhill when you are being, uh, when you're shooting, uh, uh, when you're shooting contested shots. We have a video that probably would uh, say all of this uh, uh, a lot better, and it's called, uh, What is a Good Shot? And it kind of itemizes the things that determine whether you're shooting good shot or not, and whether you should shoot it. Yeah, and if you look at players that, that work on shooting, uh, let, let's say three-pointers, if a, if a guy is shooting, most NBA players are not shooting over 40% from three-pointer. No, no, um, no. And if you watch guys in, in practice, they're shooting anywhere between 60 and, and 80% probably from yeah. behind three-point line. Sometimes. So there has to be something that's that's making that that gap. Well, uh, otherwise, they would be shooting 40, 40 plus percent from behind the line because it would be the same as in practice. There's There's got to be a variable. One of those things is probably... Being contested. Well, being contested, fatigue, the fact that uh, we're shooting against a defender that's right up against us. There's well, yeah. a whole bunch of things like that. That's what I'm saying. Yep. Um, okay, this one is from Sane de Chomling, I guess. Uh, I'm 5'7 and 19 years old. I always wanted to be able to dunk. When I jump, I'm two inches away from touching the rim. Will I ever be able to dunk? If I can, what can I do? Thanks. <laughs> okay, if you can, what can you do? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but if you're two inches away from the rim, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Um, the, when it comes to dunking, people think that it is the best thing on the planet and it's the only thing that they want to do. I will tell you that it is probably the least important thing to work about, to worry about developing in basketball. Yeah. Even the guys that do it all the time, they're not doing it every time. And it, it is not something that will take you as far as you think it will. Yeah. Right. Um, I can understand you want to do it, and that's fine. I would just I would be careful about the fact that if you focus too much on just doing that, then your other skills will definitely suffer. Um, and the thing is, too, is that to be able to dunk the ball, you have to be able to get the ball above the rim and clear the rim with the ball. So it's not just a matter of uh, you know getting your hand on the rim. Like you, you probably have to get another six to eight inches to get the ball to be able to dunk it. Yeah, in order to dunk the ball effectively, you've got to have <laughs> this part of your wrist uh, hitting the rim. Well, I mean, because you least, can't you can't get it down uh, otherwise, it's going to probably go horizontal. At least, I mean, you can see like here, here's the bottom of my hand. You got to be able to at least get that high. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's a little bit of of leeway when you're talking about that, but still, it's a, it's it's a considerable amount to get your hand over the rim. Right. But, I mean, you can work on a vertical program, and we would tell you to check out our vertical program. And all you can do is work on developing your athleticism with your jump, and it can't hurt you to do that. Well, but you can't, you can't just lay everything on the, this, this dream of dunking. I think yeah. that set minor goals first. Like, okay, I'm going to increase my vertical by two inches, uh, and then I'm going to increase it by another two inches, and just kind of build progressively up. And doing that will only help you because, you know, you'll be able to, to jump higher for rebounds. You'll be more athletic and agile. Um, and maybe dunking will be kind of like a, a happy bonus that you get. Well, there is another bonus that comes along with uh, the vertical jump program, and that is you develop uh, explosiveness. And uh, agility really comes a part of it, too, uh, when you use this program. Well, that's that overall uh, yeah. athleticism. Yeah. yeah. And but the thing is, is that that's that extra thing of explosion and, and athleticism and all that is way more important than dunking the basketball. Yeah. I mean, everybody wants to dunk, everybody. but yeah, I, the great players are not super worried about it. No. Um, okay. Let's see. This one is from, oh, actually we're in lightning round. So we got to, we got to <laughs> turn up our, our quick answers to these questions. Uh, this one is from Johnny justice. who says I worked out Saturday and after three hours of shooting, I couldn't make anything. You're overshooting. There's no question about that. One of the things that you'll find is that you should take and break up your shooting practices into sessions that are uh, probably 20 or 30 minutes, then move on to something else, then maybe come back. Because what happens is that uh, because of shooting for three hours, your, your arm, uh, your shoulders, your legs even – start to go through a fatigue. I would say even just mental fatigue. Well, yeah, and mental fa fatigue as well. But the, the thing is, is that you're overdoing that. And uh, I would take and break it into shorter sessions and do some other things in between, allows maybe your arm and whatnot to uh, recover a little bit. 
I've had players go away after uh, shooting for, uh, oh, maybe 40 minutes uh, and their arms hurting them. Okay. Because fatigue, it's not that it's damaged, it's just fatigue. Yeah, I would say. Okay, and so you're overdoing this, what you're doing. Yeah, I would definitely say that that physical fatigue, there's no way that you can keep three hours of perfect physical no. um, performance uh, in, in terms of doing the same thing. But I think mental fatigue becomes a huge part of it too because when you, you, you can't focus on all the things that you need to focus on after three hours of doing yeah. something like that. You're going to be physically tired. You're going to be mentally tired. And it's just it's not worth it to do that. Um, so definitely break it up. And, uh, you know, three hours of shooting, that's a, that's a lot, man. It is. That's a ton. Um, okay. This one is from young Matt 009, who says, how do I keep a consistent shooting form? I have a great game. I have a great game so far as driving and defense, but when I play against zone, I know I should rely on my jump shot more. My jump shot is decent, but for some reason I feel like I'm always changing my form. I used to have form that worked for me. Uh, but people said it looked like I was shooting with both hands, and ever since I, then I've tried to change it, but I have no clue why I can't be consistent with good form. I do form shooting to help, but I still don't have consistent form. Any tips? P.S. I have a sprained ankle at the moment. Is <laughs> ice a fast way to recover? Thanks. Whoa, that was a oh, long one. That was. Okay, in terms of your ankle, I mean, <clears throat> it's it's going to be rest recovery, and ice is good too. Yeah, and you know the other thing that is important too is – one of the things that happens with shooters, especially young ones, as they are shooting the basketball, the thumb on the assist hand, we call it the assist hand. Other people give it another name. But what, what happens is that oftentimes that thumb ca- creates sideways rotation on the ball when you shoot it. I would work really hard on getting that hand completely off the ball when you're ready to shoot uh, because it's going to affect the accuracy of your shot. Yeah, and, and you know, here's the thing that if if you're worried about uh, your form being consistent and, and having a form that works for you, it sounds like you you're not getting out of it what you really want. Um, so, I mean, have you kind of pared everything down to the the foundational elements of shooting? Have you worked from the ground up and doing your form shooting stuff? Um, I would say that you need to worry about doing uh, the three pillars of practice. So getting that diligent dialed in practice where you're, you're working on making sure every uh, mechanical part of your form is in the right place and uh, you know, videotape yourself, check it out make sure that you're doing all the right things um, and then amp it up to the second pillar, which is game speed, game intensity, where you're taking all that stuff that you worked on and putting it into game speed, game intensity uh, type of exercises. And then, getting the third pillar, which is uh, uh, game experience. And so you're taking the things from the first two pillars and actually playing them in a game. Um, and, you know, our, our major thing is doing the form shooting drill and then uh, doing the game speed, game intensity stuff. Also think you should check out Dennis Stanton's spin shooting workout because that is one that ha- it's like a just a full workout of different uh, form shooting and game intensity, game speed stuff. Right. So uh, check that one out. Um, okay. Here's Adam Clark. He says, I have a problem. I have a wrist. I have wrist problems, meaning I cannot get my elbow straight to the basket without my wrist, without my wrist going to the side, small finger going up. I rep a lot, but I wonder how important is squaring up really? I mean, I shoot the ball well, but I wonder if it will affect me in the long run. Well, you know, squaring up is, is kind of an interesting, uh, um, Phenomena. Squaring up often means that your square, your feet are squared up to the basket and your shoulders. Uh, and we don't teach that because we don't think that the ball is going to be delivered in front of your shooting eye. If I turn and stagger my feet, then that's going to happen. Now, what's going to happen when I square up? I don't move my hand, but I tend now to shoot off my shoulder. All right, so that's part of it. Well, Here's the he, other part. He, Hang on a second. Here's the other part of it. You say you can't keep your elbow straight. Okay, um, we should have full extension of the arm and you can't see the wrist, but this is what the wrist should look like right here. I hope you can see that when we finish. Now, some people will turn that wrist to the outside and it sounds like that's what you're talking about, which means that we pronate this way. Okay, that's going to take and direct the ball to that side. How do you correct that? You get back and you spend a ton of time having those fingers come straight through so that these two fingers are going right to and dipping in the basket every time you shoot. This is called pronation when we go this way. When you go the other way, that's called supination. Both of them will screw up your shot. What you want is true flexion. I'm dipping down here so you can see my hand a little bit. 
but this is flexion where the fingers come directly forward and down and in the middle of the basket. Yeah, and you know, here, here's the thing too, is that if, if, you, if you think about it, your arm is not in the middle of your body, so no. you have to have it over here. And I think a lot of times people use the term squaring up and it's kind of evolved into something different than what it was originally. Originally it was, yes, you have your, your shoulders and your, and your feet and your hips, everything is square to the basket. Now I really think that most people say square up and it, they mostly re are referring to just addressing the basket in terms of your shot. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't necessarily mean 10 toes to the rim and, and whatever the heck else it means. Yeah. I think it just means addressing the basket. Obviously you should have a slight stagger because that helps line everything up. It helps line up your elbow, your wrist, your shoulder, your hip, your knee, and your shooting foot. And, have and your shooting eye. Shooting eye yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So last two questions here. This one is from Ali B who says, I have a, I have a pretty big game coming up representing my borough in London. Do you have any tips for me to get ready? Also, I have a question on something specific. What is, what is there a perfect time to take my defender on? I, tend to take one dribble and then lose the ball by bouncing it on by bouncing it on my foot or the defender's foot. Thanks in advance. Love from the UK once again. Well, thanks well, for being from the UK and yeah. spreading the word. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's cool. Um, okay, well, in, in terms of getting ready, there's a couple things. Yeah, okay. If you're dribbling the ball off your feet, one of the things that we teach all of our players is that you always dribble the ball outside your pinky toe, always, unless you're trying to protect the basketball. And if you're going to go from side to side, it is knee high and it goes quick. Um, and you don't want to expose the, the ball to the defender where you could actually dribble it off their foot. You want to take and turn your body so you have them to the side and you got the ball back here and protected outside your, uh, of your pinky toe. Yeah, their foot should not be anywhere near it. No, no, no. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, you're exposing the ball to the defender and, and you don't do that. If you check out our dribbling videos, you'll be able to understand what we're talking about. right? Yeah, now. the dribble attack videos and, and even just the pure offensive moves. Yeah. And typically when people lose the ball off the dribble, it's because they just they haven't gotten the experience necessarily or the skill uh, hasn't kind of really been ingrained enough. Right. So just work on it more. That's really what it takes. Maybe you're just in that stage where it just hasn't been kind of reinforced enough. And then you're also talking about being ready for this big game that's coming up. One of the things we talk about is just mental rehearsal and kind of yeah. playing through the game before you actually are in it um, and just putting yourself through uh, kind of, you know, the course of play and, and thinking about uh, situations, situations that may arise, that you, how you're going to deal with them, uh, where they're likely to happen on the court uh, and when maybe in the game. And, you know, one of the things, like Casey says, it's really huge for most players and they don't realize it, is that you can rehearse and practice that that game in your mind before you ever go play it. And uh, uh, Casey's brother, Chase, used to do that all the time he, in college and probably in high school, too. He would actually go out onto our basketball court and he would spend time there actually kind of going through and rehearsing what he thought might happen and how he was going to uh, uh, respond to it. Real important stuff. Yeah, and you know the other thing too I think is really important is working on having the mentality of being present in the game, not worrying about what happened last time, not worry about what's going to happen, but just when you're out on the court, just worry about, okay, I'm in the game, I'm playing right now, worry about that possession, not the possession that's coming up, just play in the moment. Uh, and good luck and let us know how it goes. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay, last question. This is from Johnny Justice. He says, in my freshman games, we play in a nine and a half foot hoop and I train at a gym with a 10 foot hoop. I make a lot of shots on the 10 foot, but for some reason I can't shoot a good one on the nine and a half. Uh, on, the 20 on the 20 foot, I shoot around 80, uh, I don't think that's, I think it's 10 foot. I shoot around 80% on the nine and a half. I shoot 40% and drops my confidence. That is weird. I've never heard yeah. of a nine and a half foot hoop. No, I haven't either. Um, I, either. I don't know what I would say to that one. I, I would say, I mean, there's going to be an adjustment period for working on any diff, any variable that you, you face. There's going to be an adjustment period. Uh, I would say keep working on the 10-foot hoop. That's that's just weird that they would have yeah. you at a nine and a half foot. Yeah. Um, sorry, I mean, there's... Yeah, I don't know what to the say. The only to answer there is that you maybe before the game get a little bit of work in playing on the nine and a half foot hoop. I, I don't know. Yeah. But that's That's strange. Um, okay, so I think that's going to do it for us today, guys. If we didn't get to your question, make sure that you stick around next week for our show at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday. Um, if, if you want to send us your questions during the week, we are on, on Twitter. We're at Shot Science, Facebook, Google+. 
Um, make sure you're subscribed to us on shot uh, on YouTube. I, we are shot science there. Uh, we have a ton of our videos there. If you want to check those out, anything basketball related, we probably touched on it at least. If you want to see more stuff, let us know what you want. And uh, do we have anything else? No. Nope. Thanks for joining us, guys. We always enjoy doing yeah, this Yeah, and so please much. spread the word, too. It really yep. helps uh, grow Team Shot Science. All right, we'll catch you guys later. See ya.